Mr. President, I, I will uh, have an opportunity to speak more on VAWA and that reauthorization later, but I wanted to take some time this morning to come to the floor to, to speak about an issue that has absolutely inflamed me this week. This week, I learned that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the Department of Interior was going to make a decision, or has made a decision, to deny the construction of a single lane gravel emergency access road through a very, very, very tiny portion of a national wildlife refuge located on the Alaska Peninsula in southwest Alaska. Now, you might think, well, why, why is this such a big deal? Mr. President, you've heard me come to the floor, um, or others here in this body have certainly heard me come to the floor many times to be an advocate on, on behalf of Alaska and development of, of our resources to benefit the people of Alaska, to benefit the, the, the country as a whole. This is not a development project that I'm talking about here today. What I am addressing today is the health and the safety the safety of the residents of a small Aleut community located in the Aleutian Islands, 748 people who really don't have the audience that uh, so many constituents or so many constituents in Alaska or in other parts of the, of the country enjoy. They are kind of out of sight, out of mind, if you will. But they are not out of sight, out of mind, out of my heart. One of the most important responsibilities that we have as United States Senators, as members of Congress, is to protect the safety of those people that we represent. Well, today I want to, to tell the story of King Cove, Alaska, and what's going on. You've seen the, the picture of, of the map of Alaska, uh, the big, beautiful state. I don't have it superimposed over the rest of the lower 48, because my point today is not to talk about how big we are in context to the rest of the nation as a whole, but to put in context what we're talking about here when we talk about the community of King Cove, Alaska. Got the Aleutian Peninsula here that stretches out a thousand miles. You might not appreciate the length and scope that we're talking about here, but the Aleutian chain is just exactly that. King Cove is right on the end of this, this peninsula area here in this diagram. So it's, it's kind of out there. And when I say kind of out there, there's nothing else around there. There are no roads that connect you to get anywhere when you want to go to, quote, town. Town is Anchorage, Alaska. About uh, probably, I don't know, about 600 miles, I would guess, away. Uh, maybe even a little bit longer, probably a $1,000 uh, airplane ticket to get there. But that just kind of puts it in, in context here. So we're talking about King Cove, Alaska. To put it in, in a little better context as to, to what we're speaking about here, this is the community of King Cove, right on the end of this, this lagoon, this bay in here. All the way around the other side of the bay is an area called Cold Bay. Cold Bay was designated uh, during World War II as uh, a, 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 an air base that this country relied on. And during the war, they constructed a 10,000-foot runway. It's the second longest runway in the state of Alaska right now. And it's in pretty good shape. It is used as a, as a divert. Uh, runway. Um, NASA uses it as one of its divert places. It's a pretty good, solid airport. But over here in King Cove, and, and keep in mind, Cold Bay has about 100, maybe 100, 110 people on a good day that live in Cold Bay. Around the bay here, King Cove, is an Aleut community. It's been around for maybe a thousand years, maybe a couple thousand years. It's been around a long time. The Aleut people have lived in this part of the, of the country for thousands of years. And this community now is host to about 748 people, give or take. During the fishing season, you might get it up as high as, as possibly even a thousand people. But it's not, it's not a booming metropolis 
by any stretch of the imagination. But King Cove, as you can see, is, is, is kind of isolated here. You've got water all around of it. That's, that's fair. That's good. But you have, you've got a situation here where this community is ringed by mountains. And I've got a, a map, or not a map, excuse me, a picture here. We'll go ahead and just keep this one up. Um, picture here of, of King Cove. So when you look at where the water is and when you look at where the mountains are, it looks, these are pure, pretty fjord-like. These are not timid and tame mountains. These are the types of mountains that get your attention when you are flying in because the, 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 the airstrip here for King Cove sits right back up in this area here. So you have to come through these high mountains on all sides. And when the cloud layer is low, as it usually is in this area, uh, you've got some issues as to whether or not you've got a, a safe flyout range. So you've got clouds. You have, you have um, not only cross currents that, that hit as you are coming into the airport, but you also have the downdraft coming off these very strong, very prominent mountains, downdraft that causes turbulence that particularly impacts helicopters that might be coming into this community for, for a rescue. So again, as you, as you look at your options to getting in and out of King Cove, your airport sits about here, you're rimmed with, with uh, mountains, you can either fly in up this way or you can fly in out that way, but either way you cut it, you're moving through very high mountain, mountainous terrain with winds on all sides coming from above, clouds coming from below. It is as tricky and as difficult a navigational issue as just about anywhere in the state. And going back to, to where King Cove sits in, in the oceans here, you have weather that comes in off the Bering Sea up here, and you have weather that comes up from the Gulf of Alaska here. And they all kind of come together right around the Aleutians. The Aleutians are known to be one of the, one of the areas, at least in, in, in this country, of, excuse the expression, but we just call it snotty weather. It is foul weather way too many times of the year, not just in the winter. But we saw just, just last month the, uh, the incident with, with Shell's vessel trying to move from Unalaska across the Gulf of Alaska during January and encountering seas of up to, to 40 feet. This is the weather that we deal with in Alaska. So you've got, you've got difficult seas and you have difficult flying conditions. And yet you have people that call King Cove home and have for thousands of years. So you might ask why I'm spending so much time talking about the weather. It sets the stage for this action that the Department of Interior has taken and why I feel that this decision is so wrong-headed, so short-sighted, and so wrong, so wrong to the people who call this area home. Talking about, again, the weather and what it means. Well, when you are in a small community, that doesn't have a hospital. You don't have a hospital if there's 748 people. We have an IHS clinic, an Indian Health Services clinic. And what we have there to provide for health needs is a, is a, uh, a community health aid. Um, we might have a PA every now and again, but not always reliably. We actually did have a doctor out in King Cove uh, some years ago. Um, but that individual, he was, he was there back in 2006. He left after six months. So we don't have the medical assistance that we need. So when somebody suffers a heart attack, when a, a, a woman has a complication with a pregnancy, it's not as if you can just stay there in King Cove and seek the medical help. So what happens? 
They have to get out. Well, how do they get out? Well, you say, well, they can go out by boat. They can, they can move around by boat from here in King Cove over here to Cold Bay, where we have the second largest runway in the state of Alaska. It seems like a pretty simple solution. The problem is, is that a boat is about as dangerous, oftentimes, as flying. What happens is if you've got weather that's this stinky, it raises the waves in here, and getting a fishing vessel across with a sick person and trying to get them to, to the dock on Cold, Cold Bay side and out of that vessel is a harrowing event. We've got one picture here that we took off of, of a video that had been taken by the residents of King Cove. It might be difficult to see this, but what you're looking at here is, is a steel ladder, just a ladder going up the side of the dock. It's about a 20-foot area there. Way down at the bottom here, you can see the base of a fishing vessel. And what they're trying to do is to haul a sick elderly gentleman up this metal ladder in the rain and the sleet and the snow that's coming and you've got a boat that's pitching and heaving here and somebody up at the top of the dock ready to pick this individual up underneath their arms and haul them up onto the dock. This is not a condition that you want if you are feeling at all poorly. So, I said, well, the fishing vessel isn't helping. Maybe, maybe we can do something else. So Congress, back in, in 2005, said maybe we, could, maybe we could put a hovercraft there so it can ply the waters between this point here and Cold Bay over here, because there is a road that can take you right along here, take you across to the water. The problem, not only the seas that wouldn't accommodate but also the operational costs that were through the roof. It made no sense. And the people in King Cove and Cold Bay had acknowledged it was not going to make any sense. But they tried it, they were game, but it hasn't worked. And so what happened, what happened was action needed to be taken. Because we were seeing too many people whose lives were at risk we were seeing too many people who were killed trying to get out in an effort to seek the medical help that they need, needed. At, at some point in time, you say, this, this just doesn't work. When you, have, when you have a way out, and it could be a simple road, why wouldn't we do that to address the life and the safety of the people who live here? Back in 1979, 1980, there were a number of airplane crashes that happened as they were trying to take off and land in King Cove. In 1981, we had uh, uh, a medevac plane go down. We lost a nurse, her helper, the patient, and the medevac's pilot were all killed. They were trying to, to airlift an individual out who had suffered a heart attack. Everybody's killed. In 2010, there was an airplane crash that uh, occurred well on landing into King Cove. Della Trumbull, who has long been, been an advocate for a solution to help the people of King Cove, was watching that plane land because her daughter was coming home. And to, to be sitting there at the airstrip Watching the plane come in to deliver your daughter, knowing that the weather is foul, knowing that the conditions are sketchy, and then seeing that airplane crash in front of your eyes. Now, fortunately for Della and her daughter, she walked away. But think about the trauma of that. In February of, of 2011, the Coast Guard was forced to dispatch a helicopter out of Kodiak. So, you know, you're, you're moving a helicopter from Kodiak over here to, to King Cove, they were trying to transfer out a 73-year-old woman who was suffering from chest pains. A few days later, the Coast Guard tried and failed to reach King Cove with, with a copter to airlift an 80-year-old woman who was also suffering chest pains. Fortunately, she survived. Two days later, there's another medical airlift that was delayed six hours from leaving. 
I just got the stats from, uh, from the Coast Guard from last year. How many, how many uh, rescue missions did the Coast Guard uh, take on to go into King Cove to help those who needed help because, not because the medevacs didn't want to go help or because it was going to be too costly, it was because the medevacs refused to go in because they will not take those risks. So what do we do? We call on our fabulous Coast Guard to come in and do the job five times last year. It's scary work. The Coast Guard does it. Unfortunately, nobody was killed last year. But how many people need to be killed when you have an option for a road to get you to the second longest air runway in the state of Alaska? So let me share with others what it is that we actually did to address this problem. We said, you know what, this is not acceptable. And so, five years ago, this Congress approved a land exchange. And in that exchange, the Aleut people and the state of Alaska agreed to give up 56,400 acres of prized waterfowl habitat. And they said, OK, we're going to give up 56,000 acres here to add to the Eisenbeck and the Alaska Peninsula National Wildlife Refuge. So we're going to trade this. And in return, the government will give back about 1,800 acres. Mr. President, do the quick math on this. This is a 300 to 1 exchange that the people agreed to. And it's even, it's even less when you isolate it. We're talking about 206 acres that are at issue here. 206 acres to allow for construction of a one-lane gravel road that will be used for no commercial use. This is to be used for emergency access. If you need to get out of King Cove because you've got some kind of a condition, all you would need to do is drive 20 miles. 20 miles. Think about it. We drive. 20 miles to get from here to you know, wherever. We, we drive all the time. You don't think about it. We're talking about 20 miles to save people's lives. But it's even better than that, because when we're talking about what we're putting through a refuge, it is about a 10-mile road through this refuge that we're talking about. And I even hate to describe it as a road. It is a one-lane gravel area through this lagoon that we're talking about non-commercial use. We've agreed to this. And in exchange for this 10-mile road, we've said we're going to give you 56,400 acres to add to a wilderness area. What a deal. What a deal. This is, uh, I, I hope that you can see this, because this is important to really understand what we're talking about here. This area in the black is, is what would be subject to the exchange. This is what is going into wilderness area. All of this here, plus other acreage that is not shown on this map, in exchange for these, these red corridors there, about 206 acres. So back in, in 2009, we figured that here in this Senate, and over in the House, it was important. It was important to address the safety needs of the people of King Cove. And if we could do that by allowing for a 10 miles, 11 miles of, of new road through the Eisenbeck Refuge, we could, we could solve a lot of problems here. And again, Again, I reiterate, this road is specifically not allowed to be used for economic development. In the, in the omnibus bill that we passed, the language is specifically primarily for health and safety purposes and only for non-commercial purposes. So there were some who were so concerned that we were going to see a volume of traffic going back and forth between this community of 748 people and the 110 people that live over here, that somehow there's just going to be this wild traffic going back and forth. And it's going to disturb the, the migratory waterfall, the, the birds that come through here, the animals in this, in this refuge area. 
Well, Mr. President, I think it's important to recognize that this area is not, is, is not this, this area that has not been tracked by man, that it has not seen a presence. Again, I'll, I'll remind you, this was an Air Force base in World War II. This is the second largest runway in the state. This is an area that has seen traffic through, through vehicles, ATVs, uh, over the years because of the war. This chart here, if you can see the red tracks here, these are all the areas where all-terrain vehicle use is, is currently in play, and this has been in place since 2005, 2008. And then the areas that are kind of the red dotted are the predicted ATV vehicle travel corridors. So you can see this is, this is an, and this is all within the Eisenbeck refuge area, the wilderness area. So it's not as if this is, this is without any kind of, of access that is in place. If you look at this next picture that we've got here, this shows, this is an example of, of what we're talking about with this proposed road. Um, you're out there in the middle of, of some pretty amazing sweeping um, landscape there. But the road is pretty much a one-lane gravel road. There is not going to be any stoplights, streetlights. There is not going to be any dividers, meridians, sidewalks. There is not going to be any overpasses. This is pretty much what we're talking about here. This next chart shows the existing trails that are currently uh, within the refuge area. Again, it's, um, it's pretty much a small, narrow, one track, uh, it's not like you're going to be able to pass one another moving through, through the area. But the, the last picture that I want to show here is uh, just to give you kind of a, of a view of what the area looks like. It's amazingly flat. You are, in a, you are surrounded by a lagoon area. It is beautiful, absolutely. But these are all, these are roads that are currently in existence in the area now. So what we're talking about doing is adding, adding about a 10 mile strip that would allow us to connect the roads that exist to the road that exists in Cold Bay. To connect a community who needs to have an emergency way out that is safe. They need to be able to connect to those who are on the other side of this lagoon. And the way to do it is, a, is this simple road. Now, I, I've mentioned the concern about the waterfowl. And this is, this is where the Secretary of Interior called me and he said, I listened to the biologists. And the biologists tell me that the best way to respect this refuge is to not allow any road to not allow any road so that we can respect the refuge. And he listened to the biologist. But Mr. President, the Secretary of the Interior did not listen to the people of Alaska. He did not listen to the people of King Cove. He did not even accept a meeting with them the numerous times that they have asked to meet with him. They have flown across country to make their case. But he listened to the biologist because he wants to respect the refuge. And instead, the lives of these people are not being respected. And if this is the attitude of this Department of Interior, that we are going to respect the animals and we are going to respect the birds, but we are not going to respect the people who live there, this is the wrong way to be going. This is the wrong way to be going, Mr. President, and I will not stand for it. Now, I want to make sure that we have refuge areas. I want to make sure that we have wilderness areas. And in this exchange that we adopted five years ago, we allow for that. We are we're putting in place wilderness area, the first new wilderness area designated by Congress in a generation. 45,456 acres of prime waterfall habitat added to wilderness in Alaska. 
But you know what? That's gone. Those lands will not remain in wilderness designation unless this road is permitted because the exchange is then going to be nullified if that road's not going to be built. So we've offered up a pretty sweet deal, a 300 to 1 exchange. In exchange for the safety of the people who live there, if you don't think that we can't build a one-lane gravel road that will allow for a coexistence, a coexistence between the waterfowl that migrate through there and the people that live there, you know, we, we've got another thing that we need to be thinking about. We, we will not have, we will not have a, a practical impact on the waterfowl in, in the refuge. Well, the, the land exchange involves 206 acres. Far less is actually going to be impacted by the construction. It's, it's far less than 1% uh, of the refuge. And again, the federal government is getting 300 times more land. It's just inconceivable to me that, that we would not be able to have a resolve that works for both sides on this. And for the, for the secretary to move forward with a designation that says no road, no road, it just, it, it is stunning to me. Now some might say, well, it's because it's going to cost us money here. There's no cost to the federal government, Mr. President. State of Alaska is going to be building this. Too many people have died for there to be any legitimate excuse for further delay. And I, I, I challenge those officials within the Department of Interior. Come and visit King Cove. And don't necessarily come during the good weather, although the people of King Cove would tell you they're not entirely sure when the good weather is. But come, come and see them. Come and see what we're talking about. I've been there. And to Secret uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Hayes' credit, he too has been there. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate that others have tried and perhaps have not met with success because the weather didn't allow them in, because we weren't about to take a risk with them. Well, at a minimum, the Secretary of the Interior needs to be there, needs to meet with people, real people, like Carl Smith, a King Cove elder, an Aleut warrior. He was recognized as, as one of the amazing veterans. He's an Eskimo scout with the uh, territorial card. But look these people in the eye. Look these people in the eye and tell them that their lives are not worth as much as the lives of the birds, the black brants that, that inhabit the area. Now, it's not too late. While this decision has been, has been made coming out of Department of Interior, the Secretary, or if the Secretary Salazar is, is no longer there, his designee, they've got a legal obligation under this 2009 Act to base a decision on the road on what is deemed the public interest. And Mr. President, right now it seems to me that the, the Department of Interior has deemed that the public is made solely of, of birds and sea otters. My public, my public, Mr. President, is the real human beings that live in King Cove. So we need to make sure, we need to make sure that this decision is not based on an incomplete and a misleading EIS that concluded that with lives at stake, that no action was acceptable somehow. I will repeat, no action is absolutely not acceptable. I'm going to end my comments, uh, Mr. President, by letting you know what has happened in some other refuges. It was just a few years ago, we'll remember the uh, we were all transfixed by what was called the miracle on the Hudson. There was a commercial jetliner that hit a flock of Canadian geese, lost power, landed in the Hudson River. Uh, through the amazing skills of that pilot, nobody was harmed. Um, but what was the result of that? You might not have... The, the Senator's time has expired. Request permission for one minute. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. What actually happened was a couple years later, 
USDA's wildlife service agents went into the Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge, rounded up and killed 751 Canadian geese. The plan was to kill a thousand, but they couldn't catch them fast enough. So, Mr. President, essentially what we saw was we can kill birds in New York refuges, but we can't inconvenience the birds in Alaska. Maybe geese are less exotic than black brants. Maybe it's that the members of this body and their family and friends fly through LaGuardia and they worry about that. Well, Mr. President, I worry about the lives of Alaskans. I worry about the people of King Cove. And I am not going to rest on this. This decision that came out of the interior was a travesty. It will not be allowed to stand, and I will do everything that I can to ensure that it does not. Mr. President, I want to make sure that uh, the editorial from the Fairbanks Daily News Miner that also opposes the DOI decision is included in the record, as well as the press accounts um, that I've related the, uh, the New York uh, geese story to, to also be included as part of the record. With that, I yield the floor. Mr. President. <clears throat>